in Luganda, we have a better word for it. We call it a gigi. It, it symbolizes a rock. And I want to say to you, in 1991, 1998, the Lord began to teach me spiritual warfare in practical evangelism. I was out in evangelism in a place called Nkonge. There had been a church there of about a hundred people and suddenly everybody went backslid and there were only three people remaining, the pastor, his wife, and one believer. And the pastor came to our church to seek help, to take a crusade there and preach again. And my pastor sent me to go and prepare the ground. When I got there, they told me the many things God had done, the miracles. I said, but Lord, how can the people backslide all of them? About a hundred people backslide. And that night before we slept, I slept in the same room with the pastor. We slept on the floor praying together. And afterwards, I was, ask, I was asking God, what is the cause? What was the cause of the fall of this church? And in the night as I was sleeping, I saw myself being brought in the air as if carried on something and placed in the middle of that village. And I remember I put my arms like this behind me. And as I was watching, I, I looked on the, my left side. There I was, the church. In the dream, I saw the church. In reality, the church was not there. The following day, I asked the pastor, where was the first church? That, where were you gathering? He said it was there, and that was where I had seen it in the dream. And I saw the believers were so happy, praising God, glorifying God, and they were dancing. And then I listened, and the pastor was preaching. But there was no word in what he was preaching. He was preaching excitement, he was preaching things and jokes and things like that. And the people were laughing and re rejoicing. Then they would sing again. And the Lord said that is where the first problem was. There was no word in the church. Then, this, then after the, afterwards, they closed and went home. And the Lord said to me that was where, where the second problem was. There was no prayer in the church. And because of that, there was no faith in the church. There was no obedience in the church. The church was vulnerable. And I was in this dream. And then as I was watching, there was a big forest on the right-hand side, farther away. I had drums. In Uganda, we have drums which belong to the king. Now, this place in Konge is near another place called Bamunanika, which is the king's, it's a, a special king, place for the king's rituals and things like that. And I had these drums, do -do 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 -do. and as they were drumming, they were getting louder and louder. And the people who are not saved were saying, aha, uh -huh, let us see these Christians. They say they have power, let us see these Christians. And then I suddenly, I saw a thick darkness rise out of this, the, the forest. And as it rose up, it rested above the forest. And then I saw something like a saucer, but it was big and began rolling in, inside the darkness, going round and around. And as I was watching like this, I saw human beings, but they were black, like charcoal. And there were others who were, who were like al al albinos. Like they were light, but they were not like white, they were like albinos. And they were dancing, and there were people of all types of, the old types of animals and people of different futures, partly animal, partly man, and they were all dancing and dancing, and this thing was going round and around, and then it came, and everybody was running, the non-believers were running to their houses, but the believers were in the church, singing, then this saucer came, and it struck in the middle of the church, and I saw bodies flying, flying all over, cut in the middle, falling this way and that way, and in a moment, this thing went back, Ooh, and there was silence. And I turned to look, and there was no church. Your bodies strewn all over the place. And I saw only the pastor standing there, and his wife sitting there, and this one believer sitting there also. And I came out of the dream. I woke up the pastor and said, let me tell you what I've seen. I told him, and we said, I said, we are not going to bring any crusade here unless we are going to pray against that power and overcome it. It's a long story. When we prayed, my goodness, there was a man. God showed us a man. Every time we would come for a crusade, people would come and gather like this and would preach and preach. Just when you're about to come to the altar call, they begin to go away. They disperse. And by the time you make the altar call, they are gone. For two days, it was like this, and we began to fast and say, Lord, what is happening? And the Lord showed us in a vision a snake of three colors, blue, pink, and cream. It had a pink head, a blue back, and a cream underneath. And it showed us that is the problem, and its name is Nkonge. The same name as the village. And I said, oh Lord, what? And then we saw in another vision. No, before we saw that, we saw in a vision a tree stamp. Now, in, in Luganda, a tree stamp is called Nkonge.
So we saw in a vision, a tree stump. And every time we finished prayer, someone would see this vision and not be uprooted. And he would do like this. My name is Nkonge, I can't be uprooted. And Nkonge means a tree stump. Usually when you, the, the tree is so big, instead of uprooting it, you just cut it and leave the stump. And this man was saying, my name is Nkonge, I can't be uprooted. So we began hitting at Nkonge. Hitting at Nkonge and saying, Lord, reveal Nkonge. Then we saw this vision of the snake. And we continued interceding and said, Lord, she was, I want to tell you, beloved, it's very important to do spiritual mapping. It's very important to do research. But I want to tell you, spiritual mapping does not stop in physical research. Sometimes we need to go in the presence of God and say, Lord, reveal to us. Sometimes you can't discover what exactly there is until God points it out. And we need to do that if we press in the presence of God and abide and say, Lord, please reveal to us where is the enemy hidden. Re un unveil him, expose him. So we saw the snake and we didn't know what to do about it. Then the next day we went to preach. This was the fourth day now. And when we were preaching, the people were gathered, so many people. And then we saw one of the sisters. I was preaching, and then one of the sisters were, who were behind me praying saw a man coming. He was dressed in a tunic, black tunic, and was coming from afar. She had seen that same man yesterday, and the spirit had said to him, watch that man. That is all the spirit said. So this time she saw the man again, and she said to her, sister, to her neighbor, the Lord told me yesterday to watch that man, and here, there he is again. I don't know what is wrong with him, but let us watch that man. So the man came and sat in the middle of the congregation, and the preaching went on. Then this other sister, who had been told, turned around and said, Do you know what? I'm seeing a vision. And in the vision, I see that snake. It is seated in the middle of the people, right where that man is sitting. And when she did that, this other, this, this other sister, they began praying. After I preached, the people went away again. They all oh, dispersed. I, I couldn't get anybody saved. Four days of preaching without a single soul to the, coming to the Lord. And this sister came to me and said, this is what we saw. Do you see that man there, that one going now? He symbolizes that snake we saw in the vision. And I said, please go to him. Go and invite him to our home. Please do whatever you can. So these sisters went and they talked to him nicely and said, why don't you come home? Why don't you come? <laughs> said I'll come tomorrow so the next day we fasted we didn't eat anything we didn't drink anything we just locked our doors and we stayed in the presence and said Lord please today give us that man yeah. we don't know what he symbolized give us that man and the next day he came he stayed there he didn't come in the middle so I said to the sisters please go to him go and keep him there don't let him come here but make sure at the end you bring him home so that day we got two people saved. The people did not go away. We got only two people saved. But they brought him to our home. He came and he said, I don't want to stay along with you. Last night, my masters rebuked me for talking to you. They said, who are your masters? We asked and asked and in the end he began to tell us how his masters are so powerful. He is the chief priest of all the witch doctors in the area. He does not, he does not have a witch shrine, but the, all the witch doctors come to him for consultation. Every new moon, he told us, every new moon, something would happen to him. He, ne he never moves around in the new moon. He keeps at home. Why? Because on the new moon, a pipe, you know a pipe? A smoking pipe would come to him with, it has three heads. Do you understand? A pipe with three heads. It would come to him without anybody carrying it. It would come through the air into his mouth. And everybody around would be able to see it. It would come into his mouth full of things and fire and would begin puffing on it, puffing, puffing. And immediately he would lose his senses and his understanding of his surroundings and he would unclose himself totally naked. Whether they are visitors, children or what, he would be totally naked. And then he would get hold of a few things and he, ran, he would run away from home. He used to live on a hill which was called Monday. And he would run across to another hill which was called Chikavia. And he would stay there. 
and stay, he said he would stay there for two days, sometimes three days. We asked him, what would you be doing? He said, oh, it would be a great gathering. There would be people from China, people from India, people from oh, the nations, and we would be there. And we would be drinking and dancing and rejoicing and consulting and reporting. And he said, some people would come where he's a full man, but the head is an eagle. All is a, a man above, but the behind is a goat. Or is a woman above and the lower part is a fish. All kinds of things. And I said, are you, are you serious you saw those things? He said, yes, I see them every month. And they would confer together, they would eat. And the end he said, when everything is so, I mean, so tired and so drunk, I would fall asleep. And when I wake up, everybody has gone except one, one of three things. Either I would see a lion or a leopard or a big cobra. And then I would sit down in front of it, and it would speak to me in human language. And would give me my instructions for the next one month. What I'm going to do, and who is going to come to me. The witches which are going to come to me for consultation, I'm told. I see in the future, in the next one month, I am given the details. So I come back, and I store them in me. And then I see these people come to me day by day. I give them what they're supposed to receive. Now imagine this was a high priest and the Lord just directed us straight to him. So we began preaching to him. To him he said there is a bigger power. There is a man. His name is Jesus. And we talked to him and this man was saying, oh, I, 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 I love your word. If, and then he said, let me tell you, his name was Asuman, Asuman Semolu. And he said, let me tell you, I'm tired of serving this master. I would like to be free. I've served them for too long. I started when I was 13 years. Now I'm, I'm coming to 40 years. And he said, I'm tired. They oppress me. I have no freedom. But I'm afraid of them. I can't even, I can't even think of betraying them. And we say to him, take Jesus who protect you. He said, oh, I would love to, but he's not as powerful as my masters. So we, we, it was a long time preaching, lovingly, talking to him, talking to him. Then in the end he said, okay, I believe Jesus is a savior, but I don't believe he's the son of God. So we tried to convince him he's the son of God, and he would not. Even now he was bringing his Islam. Then I said to him, okay, wait a moment. Do you believe he's a savior? He said, yes. Do you want to have him as your personal savior? He said, yeah. I said, let, let us first pray for that. Are you willing to pray? We pray for you. You receive him as your personal savior? He said, yeah, yeah, that, oh, that's all right. So he said, okay. And we began to lead him in prayer. And we said, now, pray from the bottom of your heart. And this man humbled himself like a baby and began to pray. And when he pronounced these words, today, I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ came to save the world. And by his blood, I can be saved. I therefore accept today to receive righteousness from above. And I declare that Jesus Christ is my savior. The moment he said that word, power of God came upon him. The demons began to scream. And the man became so powerful. He was a short, stout man. And he wanted to run away. The demons wanted to make him run away. And we got hold of him. We were about six men. And there were about seven women. The women all ran to the... <laughs> <laughs> we held... The... Normally, in deliverance, I don't hold people. I don't advocate for holding people. Because the more you hold a person in deliverance, the more violent they become. The better you leave him and command them to be weakened. But I hadn't learned that. So we held the man. And the man would do... Whoa! And would... Oh, oh. <laughs> And we all fall down. So in the end, we had to get ropes. We threw the rope around him and oh! <laughs> and we bound him. And we began casting out demons. Come out, come out. So in the end, he came back to his senses. And said, and was crying. Said, Balokoli. Balokoli means saved you Christians. What have I done to you? Why are you binding me? Why, what have I done to you? And said, sorry, it was not you. We began to explain. Then he said, yes, yes, yes. There, I can see them. I can see those spirits there. And he could name them by name. He could call them. He was calling them by name. And was saying, please don't kill me, so and so, don't kill me. So we began rebuking. Oh, you spirit called so and so. Get out in the name of Jesus. And 
sudden, this man starts there walking. Oh, because as we were commanding, he was seeing in the spirit the power of God getting hold of this spirit. And, and later on, he said, what kind of power is this? And I said, that is the name of Jesus. And said, now I believe Jesus is the son of God. Hallelujah. He said, I, I, I want this, I want this Jesus. I realize it's more powerful. I can be free. I, can, I don't have to serve these demons. So we prayed for him again and laid hands on him. We anointed him. And he said, come home. This, the pipe is still in my... You see, the pipe which used to come to him, he would go with it to the mountain of Chikabia and come back with it and put it in the sh threshold of his door. And he would spend there three, four, five days and it would disappear. And he would come back the following new moon. So he said, I left it home. Come, let me go and give it to you. So we went at night with our torches. But we rushed, reached there and it, it had disappeared. <laughs> anyway, this man came to the Lord. Hallelujah. And I want to say, in one week, we had more than a hundred new converts yeah. in that church. Yeah. What is this? When we broke the power which was holding the territory, we, the deliverance was released. People came to the Lord. People came to the Lord. So what we are really talking about here is not just some wonderful topic you can choose to live or take. We are talking about setting captives free. And we need to seek God for that discernment to know where to strike and open the gates. Now, oh Lord, I want to use my next 30 minutes. In 1990, I met a man, I met someone, no, I had a vision. I was praying and said, Lord, teach me warfare. Teach me warfare. Because I was in a very, very difficult area, very affluent, very rich. And there was no breakthrough. I had done everything I knew to do. And then I saw things in the spirit I didn't understand. So I went to different men of God whom I trusted and said, do you understand this? Can you help me with it? Now, one man said to me, brother, what you are sharing sounds very much like what one man shared in his testimony. There's a man who is an evangelist now and is an intercessor. His name is Katongole. And he told us some things like that. So I sought out this man. And I told him, this is what I saw. I was told that you were a satanic agent. Now you are a man of God. You are an evangelist. You are setting people free, coming to the Lord. Do you understand this? And he began to share with me things. A lot of things. A lot of what he shared with me puzzled me so much. I went into a fast of 10 days, just asking God, Lord, is this true? If it's true, confirm it to me. And again, God showed me the same vision again. Now I had more light. I understood it. It was clearer. I understood it. There's no time to go into the details, but I just want to go into the lessons of it. Is that all right? Now, when we talk about principalities and powers, in the spirit, these forces create a rock-like barrier in the heavenlies to separate people on earth from getting a clear breakthrough as they pray into the Holy of Holies. It is this barrier which forms that hindrance in prayer. Where people feel like, have you ever felt like you're speaking and you're, your words are knocking a rock? Yeah. It's as if you're just throwing words on the rock. And it's this material, this bondage, this stronghold, this blanket of darkness that forms like a rock-like material that hinders the fellowship and the breakthrough in prayer. And as long as it, it abides on a land, it will do the influences such as the things we were sharing yesterday. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, what happens? This man shared with me and said, demons operate on top of this layer. And satanic agents and witches have seasons. They leave their body and go up there to operate with the demons in the spiritual realm. They go and wage war together with the spirit, the spirits. And he said, this is very important to the devil because when human agents get involved in this, it is strengthened ten times. 
because man has the authority to rule by God's own word. The demons can do things, but when man stands up to do things, he has that authority which God gave. You see, the gifts of God are irrevocable. So that's why the devil wants all these witches and sangomas and satanic agents and spiritists and is teaching our children in schools. There are many schools, especially in the Western world, and I believe many schools in, in uh, South Africa are beginning to do this, where they're teaching children transcendental meditation. And they're teaching children about getting a spirit guide. They're teaching children what they call self-discovery. I tell you what, all that is the stuff from Alice Bailey, who was a deep occult pr prophetess, who was saying, let the children discover themselves by discovering the spirit guide assigned to them. That, that's their other nature. And it's coming all over. And when people are released into this arena, they have the power of astral traveling, of leaving behind their real beings and traveling in the spirit. Now, when they travel in the spirit, they are vulnerable because God has not intended them to do like that. Therefore, they are at the mercy of the devil. And he takes them into operation in the spiritual realm to strengthen his opposition to Jesus and to his body. So, you just think about how many human agents participate in this war. The Sangomas, the witches, spiritists, these people in yoga. These people in transcendental meditation and all that kind of thing, they all go at one season or another into this realm and they participate. And when they are up there, they strengthen the resistance over the territory. Hallelujah. Now, as I was talking with this man, thank God he's now an evangelist and is really bringing people to the Lord. He said he used to go up there too. You know how this man was saved? He had come to destroy a church. And it was as he was hovering over the top of that church, at the angels, he saw angels coming in from all sides and get hold of him and pull him through the roof down into the church. Now, he had left his body back home. But when he came back to his senses, he was there with his body. And you know what? The, ch the people in the church were praying, God revealed to us what kind of power the devil has assigned to us. And we are coming against it. And here was this satanic agent on, on top above the church. And he was brought in. <laughs> there he was. And they began casting out demons. They didn't know how he had come in. He explained later. They thought he had just walked in. And he was the demons were commanded and left him and he came to the Lord Jesus Christ and is now a servant of the Lord and he said when he used to be up there the prayers of the saints would be visible to their eyes when the saints are praying these spirits either human or angelic would be able to see the prayers of the saints now he said, when you watch people on earth, there are two types of people. The unbelievers are clearly manifest. There is no light at all in them, while the believers have got a light inside of them. Hallelujah. Then he said, among the believers, there are three types of believers. There, there is a believer, you see, that around him, there is an, an aura of light around him. And it goes up like a pillar and goes up and touches that barrier up there. And when these Christians begin to pray and press in, they press through that barrier. And they, they, their prayers go through into the heavenlies. Then there are other Christians who they saw have got the same aura of light around them. But it doesn't go up to that barrier. It stops somewhere. It's like it is hindered and says usually those Christians have been so held captive in evil habits and hidden sins that their cover is beginning to dwindle. And when these people pray, they feel like their prayers are not even hitting the rock. They feel like they're speaking into the air. Have you ever prayed like that? I have ever prayed like that. When you pray and you feel, eh, it's like I'm speaking to myself. You throw the words and they are like they are getting lost somewhere in the air there. But if you persist, because greater is he who is within us. Amen. If we pray on, there is an outpouring of the spirit that comes forth from within us that releases and breaks through 
Every Christian is able to break through however weak you may have been compromised. Then he said there is another type of believer who has no aura at all around him. Now I use this word aura, I know it can be used in the evil sense or in the rightful sense, but I'm using it just for lack of a better word, I hope you understand. But I mean that there's a surrounding, there's a kind of surrounding of a light. That is the way he put it. He says, we see a light. And I refer this to what I read in the scriptures as the pillar of God's presence. And he says, but with some Christians, you see the light inside, but there is no any presence around them. The light is there, but there is nothing around them. And he says, these are vulnerable. We can use them. That we could use them for any purposes we desired. This is why I want to emphasize again, the presence of God is very important. All right, let's move on. And he said, when, the, when these people pray, their prayers can only go as far as their pillars go. Amen. But if they persist in prayer and they keep praying and they pray from the depth of their heart, there is a new power released that reaches above, 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 and it extends this pillar and goes higher and higher. And it said, the prayers of the saints comes usually in two types. Usually many saints begin to pray and their prayers appear like smoke. And that it's like smoke going up. And it says, many, many times, excuse me, this smoke does not break through that barrier. It goes up, it's like, just like you look at the ceiling. It goes up and touches that and begins to meander around. He says, but when Christians persist in prayer and go deeper and the passion comes in, suddenly there comes fire in the smoke. It begins to be smoke with fire and there are sparks all around. And says, when this begins, when this, this is beginning to happen, the chief princes up there summon evil spirits from all around and say, stop him praying, distract him, get him off his feet for anything, do anything to stop that prayer. And some Christians don't understand why they are so distracted in prayer. When they are concentrating, the phone rings and they go to take the phone. <laughs> when they are concentrating, someone knocks and they say, okay, what do you want? And there are some Christians who are so masterless. They see you praying and you're deep in the spirit and they come and say, excuse me, excuse me, where is the spoon? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> At the end of the day, by the time you turn around and say, oh, it's in the cupboard in the second drawer. That's where I put it. You come back here. You have been distracted. You were about to break through. You were about, but then you've been distracted. It's important as intercessors to take note of these things. Hallelujah. The devil hates an intercessor who breaks through. And it's, it, it, look, it's, it all comes from within, the spirit within us. Once the spirit is charged, something is released. And the fire begins to go up. You begin to feel, yes, my, my prayer. Oh, hallelujah. The prayer becomes in, intensive. You begin to enjoy it. You may even be crying, but you are enjoying what is going yeah. on. Hallelujah. Because it's not the cry of sorrow. It's really the cry of the heart. And you know, I'm groaning by the spirit of the living God. And as it goes up, it's like fire. And this man said, when that fiery smoke begins to come, the rock melts like wax. It's like candle, it can't resist. It just melts and creates an opening. And that prayer goes through. And it's like a tall pillar. They say, and the place around that area where it has melted is so hot. We can't stay. We all run away. And we watch from afar as that pillar continues to go up, 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 up. They can't stop it. They can't stop it. Some of these things, when I learned them, I said, oh my goodness, I'm going to pray. I am going to pray. I know there's a moment when the devil is totally weak, powerless, against my prayers. Hallelujah. Someone shout amen to God. Amen. 
And listen what he went on to say. He says, after it has been done, when the intercessor, the, the Christian has finished praying, we wait. When he finishes, he may go to bed, he may walk away, and this pillar walks on him. He moves around with this covering. He is not under the blanket. He is under this covering. And the pillar, he says, the pillar paves through the covering like wax. It goes making way, making way. He's not moving in the kingdom of darkness. He's in the kingdom of our God. He's moving with heaven, a connection with heaven, with him. And then he says, many Christians don't know how to maintain that pillar. It is maintained by unceasing prayer and continuous praises. When, I, when the Lord first called me into ministry, the first thing he taught me, he said, let my praises never leave your lips. And I didn't know why until I found it in the Bible in Psalms 34. The praises of the Lord shall not leave my lips. And the Lord, the, the, this man said, if the man is praising God all the time, not only with his lips but also with his heart, and continuing to talk to God and to listen to God and commune with God, you can't stop that pillar. But if the man is taken, if your attention is fully taken by the circumstances around you, he says the best way we quench that pillar is you bring temptation. Maybe you bring a beautiful woman, and as he spends time all oh, meditating and looking, something is dying within, something is dying above. He says sometimes we bring situations of bitterness. We make him so angry, he goes out of the spirit, shouts around and feels so bad. He goes around gloomy. By the time he cools and tries to pray, have you ever gone through that? You pray very well in the morning, something happens, you are so angry, by the time you want to pray, there is no presence. You begin to struggle, oh my, oh my, Lord, please, I want to talk to you, and the, the, it's so dry. The devil will do anything to cut off that connection. And once they cut it off, he says, once they cut it off and it goes, and where does it die? It does not die there fast, it weakens in your heart. And once it weakens in your heart, that pillar weakens and then they come and seal the hall. Now listen, do you know what the Lord taught us when he said fill the land with prayer? He said I want watchmen, people who will pierce through the darkness. And as many as pierce through the darkness, they are like lighthouses. The darkness over the city, if it can be pierced by so many people, so many people, so many people, it's like a blanket full of holes, full of holes, full of holes, and the light is coming through, light is coming through. The more people are doing it, the more light is coming in. But that's not all. The more these people persist in the presence of God, the thicker or the wider their pillar of light. And if your house prays together in a family altar continuously and you encourage even your children to break through, there's a pillar that comes upon your house. Yeah. And this pillar becomes bigger and bigger as you continue pressing in the presence continually, daily, faithfully. And you know what happens? If we can have enough houses in a city pressing in like this, we will soon pull down the blanket of darkness. Because the, the light will yoke up with the light from the neighbor, will yoke up with the light from the other side. Eventually the darkness will be squeezed in the middle and will come away. When we are do, doing our spiritual affair, we can pull open and we shall have what is called open heavens. Amen. But the person who breaks into the presence of the Lord has got open heavens over his personal life. A house which prays together into the presence of God has got open heavens over that roof. And I tell you what, the hardened sinners to whom the gospel has been preached and they don't understand, they argue, when they come in the presence, when they come to meet a person over whom there is that presence, they come under open heavens. You know what that means. Every yoke in their lives weakens. And suddenly they feel, oh. Sometimes they begin to talk about deep things, deep wounds in their lives which have caused them to act like they are acting. Things they have not shared with anybody. They tell you, and I've never told anybody this, but let me tell you. Then you know something is beginning to move. It's not by power, nor by might, it's by that presence. And I tell you what, sometimes even in meetings, 
If the intercessors have prayed and pulled down that presence, it comes upon the whole meeting. And that is why people find it easier to be delivered and healed in meetings like this than, in, than when you pray for them elsewhere. It's because the intercessors join together and corporately press through and create that pillar up around them that presses up into the open heavens. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. And, looks like I've got to finish. When we pray, this is what happens very quickly. Very soon God sends the angel with the answer. Let us imagine that your answer is like a box the angel is holding. Now this is what happens. When they succeed, when they don't succeed in closing the gap, the angel comes through. They can't touch him. Because the place is hot. They can't come anywhere near it. He comes through very smoothly and brings the answer. Amen. And then he can go back very smoothly. You can remember two occasions when that happened. Jo Jacob was not a mighty intercessor, but his father Abraham and Isaac had been, had been praying through the land, and they had broken through. So he was able to see the angels of God going up and coming down without any resistance. Daniel was a mighty intercessor, better than Jacob, but was in a land which had never been prayed through. The satanic priesthood in that land was more vigilant than the godly priesthood. So the land was thick. And though he was a mighty intercessor, he had to pray so hard. 21 days before a single angel could come through to him. You remember when Nathanael met Jesus Christ? Nathanael said, yes, you are the Messiah. And the Lord said, have you believed? Just because of that, you are yet to see the angels of God going up and coming down over the Son of Man. What was Jesus saying? I walk with a pillar around me. You are going to see the kingdom of God. I'm not walking under this, this earthly kingdom. I'm not like the Pharisees. You are going to see the angels manifesting and the miracles being done in my ministry. You are going to see a lot more proof that will show you I am the Messiah. Because I'm walking in this open heavens. Praise the name of the Lord. But if they succeed in closing, I'm going to go quickly through this. This is what happens. He said, and, and I want to quote my brother here, and he said, the demons gather together because they know the answer is coming. Every person who pierces through is bound to have the answer. Why? Because Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, it shall be given. Amen. And if you abide in me and I'm always abide in you, when you abide in the presence and you press through, the answer must come. One way or another, God will send an answer. He will send a word back. But these demons know, and these satanic agents know, the answer is coming. So they wait. They march your forces there to wait. And it says, very soon the angel shows up with a package. But the first thing they watch is the, how is he attired? How is he dressed? Does he have a helmet on his head? Does he have a breastplate? Does he have a belt? Does he have the boots? Does he have a sword? Does he have a shield? Because that's then they can see the vulnerable spots to hit. And the way the angel is dressed depends on the intercessor below. The way you are dressed is the way the angel will be dressed. If the angel has got no helmet, your mind, you don't bother about controlling your mind with a, with a helmet of salvation, then they aim at the head. They shoot at the head. If he has no breastplate, they aim, they aim there. If he has no shield, they, they attack knowing he can't defend himself. If he has no sword, they attack knowing he can't break through, he can't cut his way through. If he has no feet, they set the, the, the field on fire. So he may be attired above, but if he has no feet, he's jumping up and down in the, in the fire. Remember, all these are spirits, both were angels in heaven. They can affect each other. They live in the same kind of world. They can set a fire. It affects them. And the angel will be fighting in the fire, trying to preserve your package. And he said, the first, as soon as we create that atmosphere of insecurity for the angel, the next thing we do, we go for the package. We go for the package. Why? Because the Bible says in the book of James, don't ye be deceived. Every good thing comes from the Father of lies. Why, why is it that people go to Sangomas, to witch, witch doctors, and get good things? Some people go there and they say they get children. They get wealth. They get, where do they get them from? The devil has never created a single good thing. They rob the prayers that are unprotected. 
They rob those people who pray. They even get visions. Oh my goodness, God has shown me. Hallelujah. I know it's the answer is coming. God has assured me. Then it doesn't come. Where has it gone? Robbed on the way. This is why Jesus said, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And he gave that parable of the woman who went to the judge. And he said, won't the father answer his children who cry out unto him day and night while he's still patient? Now, just think about that. Why would God be patient when I'm crying to him? Is he patient with me when I'm crying to him? No. He wants to answer me. What, what is he patient with? The scaffolds in the heavenlies. He has sent my answer. My answer is not yet to me. But God is patient, waiting for the battle to work itself out, and I get my, my answer. But then Jesus said, but when the Son of God comes, will he find faith on earth? When eventually the breakthrough comes, will he, will, he, will he find you still waiting? Or are you going to sleep and stop praying? Because when you sleep and stop praying, the answer is going to be stolen away. And where does it go? Because it's a spiritual package, it can be taken in the spirit and possessed by someone else who has got spiritual powers. And then they use this to deceive people who come to them in which in shrines, and they say, you bring this and this, then you will get a baby. And people get pregnant by going to witches. You wonder, God, you are the author. You are the creator of every being. The devil has never created anyone. Where do these people get babies when they go to witches? Hallelujah. And they can steal anything, anything if you don't guard it. Amen. Now, very quickly, the, this is what happens. And this is what the Lord taught me. He says, when the battle is going on, usually when the angel is beginning to come forth and there is a battle going to come, the Holy Spirit begins to prompt the person who be, to whom the answer belongs. Begin to pray. <coughs> And how many times does the Holy Spirit say, begin to pray? And you say, oh, I will pray later. I'll pray in the, in the morning. Then in the morning you oversleep and say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I did not pray. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'll pray in the evening. You think you're doing him a favor? God is coming to you and say, your thing is coming. Begin to create an opening. And many people say, oh, and they go and pray and say, oh, and they pray a little. And they say, at least I've prayed, Lord, I've prayed. You think you're helping God by praying? And what happens? The battle begins. And it intensifies your... The angel can only do exploits according to the exploits you do in the spirit. The battle is not for the angel. The angel is simply a manifestation of your spiritual exploits. He's a ministering angel to you. And he can do nothing above what you can do in the spirit. It, the battle is yours. It's you. And that's why the Holy Spirit does not reside with the angel. He resides with you. So that he can help you. He's our helper. And the, angel, the Holy Spirit wakes you up and says, come on. Even in the night you're sleeping, the Holy Spirit says, come on, wake up, pray. Pray. And why? Because something is at stake up there. Something is at stake. And you say, oh, I'm so sleepy. I'm so sleepy. Look, I said I'll pray at five. Come on, God. And you still have two hours to go. And... But you don't know you are losing something. And sometimes you, you feel that urge to pray. Even when you are working, there's that anointing of prayer on you. And you feel, pray, pray, pray. But sometimes you think, oh, what will the people think? What will the people think? If possible, run away. Go to the toilet at least. Lock the door and spend some time praying in tongues until you know how to pray better in the spirit, in the understanding. Do something because something is at stake. You must understand we are operating in two worlds, in this physical world as well as in that spiritual world. We can't see clearly in the spiritual world, but we have the Holy Spirit as our guide. And when you don't pray, something happens. This the package is stolen. But that's not the end of the story. They begin fighting the, the angel himself. They begin fighting the angel himself. Why? Because he, ex, he, he represents your spiritual exploits. And when they begin to fight, this man, Katongole, said, the first thing they try to, to do after they've taken the package is get the angel out of the pillar. Get him out of the pillar because he can't operate out of the pillar. He's supposed to operate in that pillar. That is, it's like a radio with a channel. That is your frequency with God. 
So if, if they can get him out, do you know what happens? When they get him out, suddenly you feel in your spirit like God is so far away from you. You, you try to pray and you feel, you don't even know how to start talking to God. God is so far away from you. And you begin groping for words and you begin doing that. And you, you have to pray, Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. You do a lot of things to come back into that place where you feel, yes, now I can pray. Because he has been pulled away. And many, many times when such things begin to happen, the Lord says to you, you need to go into a fast. Because if you don't do that, things are getting worse. You need to go into a fast. And how many times does God say to us, go into a fast and you say, oh, I will do that next week on Monday. I start on Monday. Then Monday comes, you don't. You, Tuesday comes, you start and by noon you break it. And then you say, oh, next week again. And, and what are you doing? The next thing that happens, they begin to bind the angel. Now you tell me, can demons bind an angel? Look at the angel who came to Daniel. He said, I was detained. They begin to bind the angel. And this man, Katongle, said, yes. It happens, especially if you don't have a prayer cover, other people praying with you. You only be like your angel is coming through the battle alone. But when you have others, that's why it's important to network. When we are with others, there is reinforcement. When others pray and they are praying for everybody covering, there's reinforcement. Other angels come into the, come into the scene and they can't, they can't uh, run around our angels like that. That's why it's very important to keep in, in touch with others. Anyway, when that doesn't happen, they bind him up. And you, they, have you ever had people who say, I, I, feel, I, feel like, I feel like I'm bound. I feel like I'm, I'm not free. Today, I, I don't feel free. Have you ever felt like that? And what have you done about it? If you don't do something about it, you're allowing them to continue the bondage. And when that happens, the next thing they do, they begin, they take this angel away from their territory into a territory of a higher demon spirit. Like the angel of Daniel said, I was taken and I, I, I dwelt there with the kings of Pasha. And when he's there, they begin to de derob him, they to, to take off his armor, whatever he has. If it's a belt, they take it off. If it's a helmet, they take it off. And that is why on earth you find people who had the scriptures on their tongues. They could quote scriptures. Suddenly, the scriptures are gone. They can quote no more scriptures. They have forgotten the scriptures. Not only do they forget the scriptures, they forget even where the scriptures are. Suddenly, they find they begin to tell lies unnecessarily. Men of truth begin to tell lies. Men of faith begin to walk in unbelief. They are so full of anxiety, so full of fear, so full of all kinds of things. Why? They are being dis disrobed. I mean, they are, they, the attire is being taken away. They are being laid naked. The people who are so zealous for the gospel suddenly lose the fire of the gospel. People who knew how to control their minds and they could push out temptation. Now it's come temptation. You find that they are doing all kinds of things. And say, but this man is a man of God. He used to be so powerful. What is happening to him? That's why it's so important to pray for the saints. Paul says, pray for the leaders, pray for the saints, pray for the, for the people of God. Because you don't know what is happening in their lives. In, in the end, after the devil has clearly taken that in bondage, what does he do? He sends his own angel as an angel of light. And he comes instead of the other angel who used to come and minister to you the things of God. Now the angel of the devil comes and ministers to you. That's he brings false revelation. He brings false guidance. He starts leading you left and right. He starts leading you in things and then things begin to happen. One of the most, the commonest thing, now this is rarely talked about. One of the commonest things the devil uses in such a circumstance is spiritual sexual abuse. People go to bed, and when they, they are sleeping, they dream of having sex with another man or another woman. And sometimes they wake up and think, oh, that was a bad dream. Come on, when you dream like that, wake up, go into spiritual affair. And let that be a sign to you, things are very bad in the spirit. You need to do something drastic. I was ministering with a team of about six, I mean eight people, and six were ladies, and two were men. And we didn't know much of what was going on until one day the Lord showed me something. I called one of the sisters and said, do you have this experience in your dreams? 
And at first she kept quiet and looked down and she didn't answer. And I said, tell me, I'm saying it because the Lord has shown me something. And I said, why are you asking me? I told him what I had seen. Then she began to say, almost every other night I get a dream. And I dream a man sleeping with me. But it's not just a dream. When I wake up, there are physical signs on my body that I have been abused. And says, a few days ago, I had this dream, and I woke up, I was conscious, and I felt this man lying on top of me. I was not sleeping, I was not dreaming, he was lying on top of me. I could feel him, and I was in a position like a woman with a husband. And she marshaled all her strength to push this man away, and shouted. And she, and suddenly there was nothing, nothing. She said, was I dreaming? She looked at herself, she examined herself, and she had been in an act. She, she, every sign of having been in an act with a man was there. And that's when the Lord showed me this. Now, many people are so ashamed to talk about these things, they keep quiet. Now, you, you know, you, most of you have got backgrounds which have con related with witchcraft, that in many, many times, which doctors abuse the customers who come to them. The women who go to them for different things, they say, I'm going to give you this, and it's going to be deposited inside of you. They take them to the back rooms, and they sleep with them. Why? Because through sexual intercourse, the whole defense of a person is opened up. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, every sin that man commits is outside him, but the sexual sin is inside a man. And does not only defile you, it makes you one with the one you sleep with. In other words, every covenant he has in his life begins to operate in your life. Every power he has yielded to begins to operate in your life. And when these things begin to come to us, we are laid totally defenseless. Infirmities come upon us, and we are prayed for, they don't go. Because why? We will still have that open door. We've not made up our mind to close that door. And that door is not closed because the man of God has laid hands upon you. That door is closed when you make up your mind. I'm going to live a living prayer life. I'm going to walk with my God in this, under the presence, sealed unto God. And I've discovered this is not only to Africans. I've, I've been walking around in the world. It's all over the world. People are abused. People are broken through. I mean, the defenses are broken through. People are laid bare. And you find all kinds of bondages. We were in Brazil. It was amazing. The torments people go through. In the UK, the torments people go through. Demons oppressing people. They don't know what to do. And they give all, all kinds of scientific names. Oh, you see this sickness is called like this. Oh, you see this means that and that. But it, is all, it all goes back to what? Spiritual oppression and torment. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You find sicknesses. You find barrenness can come like that. You find sometimes things we do, everything we touch, is like we are giving access to the devil. Everything you touch, your business, your what, everything you touch, the devil comes in and destroys everything. And people wonder, why is it that everything I touch just crumbs down and dies? Listen, they, they, we have you have tried, you've gone to men of God and said, pray for me, pray for me. They have laid hands. Sometimes the demons have gone out, sometimes not. Sometimes you have been prayed for, you lie down on the floor under the anointing, and then you go back and the things come back again. The answer is not, is not in someone else doing it for you. The answer is in you making up your mind. I am going to build my prayer life in such a way that I am under a divine diplomatic cover. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I would love to go on and on, but let me stop here. It's already beyond my time. I'm very sorry. Let me say this. You may be here, and I know that there are many people right here who have had the misfortune of walking in Christianity without knowing that they must maintain their defense. You know the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastics that God will build a wall around every person, but the man who breaks his wall, the snake, shall bite him. Amen. And many of us have allowed our walls to be broken through and the snakes have beaten us. God is not judging you tonight. But God is saying to you, if you repent today and you promise God, I'm going to rebuild my wall. We heard about Nehemiah. If you say, I'm going to rebuild my wall, God is willing not only to help you rebuild the wall, but to set you free from whatever bondage had come to you as a result of this. Amen.
Now, the time is short. We shall not have the time to go laying hands on everybody. But the anointing of God is in our midst. We can rise up on our feet. We can take a moment and just pray and say, Lord, I'm sorry. We get us to repent to God for being negligent about our lives, for, being op for having opened up. Hallelujah. And afterwards, we shall go together in spiritual affair. Will you, will you raise, rise up to the, your feet and just raise your hands in a, a sign of surrender and humility to God and let us go into repentance where we have opened up, where we've not been vigilant, where we have allowed the devil to have heyday with our lives. Let us cry to God, please forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Lord. Come on, go ahead, lift your voice and begin to talk to God. Begin to talk to God. It's personal. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. Oh, Jesus, I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. So come.
together into spiritual warfare the devil has done enough we want to say to the devil enough is enough you know what the areas in your personal life where he has tried to mess you up you know what he has robbed from you the things you prayed for and you've not seen you know the areas in your church in your family in your business in your city with your children with your husband or wife let us now go together in spiritual affair and just under the covering of God's presence here. I want us to raise our voices to God. There is a covering on us, so I want to say to you, do not you fear. Let us raise our voices. Will you go with me? Say these words with me. Will you raise your hands to the Father? The Father. Now lift your hand, voice higher. The Father. I thank, you I thank you because you love me. You are speaking to me, Lord, because you want me to be an overcomer. Oh God, I'm sorry about the past. But today, I take my position name of Jesus I lay claim upon my spiritual covering and father your word says when the enemy when the thief is is caught he will pay back seven times today today we are catching the thief. Devil! Devil! Enough is enough! In the name of Jesus! We come against your spirit! We come against every foul spirit! In the name of Jesus, we break it. We break it. In the name of Jesus, you foul spirits, your powers of darkness, we command you. Jesus, I come against the burdens in my personal life, in my marriage, in my children, in my business, in my territory, in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and attack every power of the enemy. Go ahead and deal with the forces in the name of Jesus.
to have the leaders to pray over us. But before we do that, we're going to take some, some two prayer items. There are people here. And you know the things I've been talking about where the enemy would come in the night and abuse you. Abuse you. You're totally helpless. You, can't, you don't like it. You can't help it. And I've told you that's the ultimate position of defenselessness. But today we want to pray for your restoration. If you're here and you want to say to Jesus, yes, somehow my defense has been broken to that level, but I want to be re restored. I just want you to raise your hand to the Father.